Cicero, in defense of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, 80 for the Christian Era, Part 3. Translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham. My motive in quoting these instances is not to suggest that they are in any way comparable with the matters we are investigating today, but what I want to establish is this. In the time of our ancestors, men of eminence and distinction, who might have at any time been called upon to guide the nation's affairs, nevertheless lavished a great deal of time and trouble upon the cultivation of their soil. Consequently, a person who has spent his life in the country, and therefore defines himself as a countryman, must never be regarded as blameworthy for so doing, especially when it is borne in mind that no other occupation could possibly have been more agreeable to his father, or more pleasing to himself, or indeed, speaking generally, more worthy of praise. So this, Arucius, is how you set out to prove that the father violently hated his son. The proof that he did so, you say, is because he allowed the young man to remain in the country. Or is there something else as well? Yes, there certainly is, declares Acrurius. His father was proposing to disinherit him. Now, if that's true, there's an assertion which would be distinctly relevant. What are you saying? Now, it could actually have something to do with the case. Now, I do feel you have to agree that you, your corroboration of this statement upon the grounds that he never went to any parties with his father is frivolous and besides the point. How on earth could he? He never even came to town, except very rarely indeed. People hardly ever invited him to their houses, you say. Well, that's not very surprising. After all, he didn't live in the city. And in any case, he was in no position to ask them back. But surely, you must realise perfectly how well futile these last two arguments are. Let us go back, then, to what we were beginning to discuss just before, because it would provide the firmest proof of hatred that could possibly be found. The father intended to disinherit his son, you say. I am not asking you why he intended to do this. All I want is to be told how you were so certain it was his intention. And yet, I must admit, one can't help also feel that it really was your inescapable duty to explain and enumerate every single motive that existed in his mind. For it would surely have been expected of any conscientious prosecutor who was charging someone with a crime of this magnitude to set out the most meritorious list, <coughs> meticulous list of every one of the son's vices and misdeeds, which could possibly enrage the father to such an extent that he overcame all his personal inclinations and banished from his heart every trace of his deeply implanted affections, until the end even contrived to forget that he was a father at all. For this remarkable transformation, I am certain could not possibly have ever taken place unless his son had committed offences of the most outrageous character. However, leave them undefined, if that is what you prefer. It's all the same to me. Nevertheless, if you are really having no such offences to this point, that shows you are admitting they don't exist. But when we come to your statement that the older Roski has proposed to disinherit his own son, that you really do have to prove. Very well, then. What are your arguments? None. Certainly. That possess any foundation whatsoever. But do at least invent something plausible, since otherwise it would be all too plainly clear to everybody what you are, in fact quite plainly doing, and what I mean it is, you are simply treating the distress of my unfortunate client and the dignity of this eminent panel of judges as targets of mockery and ridicule. So the father wanted to disinherit his son. Why? I still have no idea. Did he actually take this step? No. Who prevented him? Well, he was thinking about it. Whom did he inform of that? Nobody. But charges and imputations of this kind which you are quite incapable of proving, indeed are not even attempting to prove, are nothing better than an insult to this court, and to the law of the land, and to the high authority of the judges before whom we are appearing. We are all perfectly well aware, Eruchius, that your attack on your younger <coughs> Sextus Roscius is not motivated by any history of personal enmity. Everyone understands the motive that has brought you into the court to speak against him today. It is his money. So, why say any more? 
And yet, there is one more thing, after all, that still needs to be said. If you had reflected that the opinion that these judges form of you might have certain repercussions upon your own future, the thought might have tempered your greed. And surely the stipulations of the Remnian law are by no means negligible either. The existence in any city of a large number of prosecutors has its uses. For this at least means that people are unlikely to commit so many crimes, because they will be afraid to do so. But the existence of these men is only useful on the condition that they do not blatantly make fools of us. Let us imagine a man who is innocent, but has come under suspicion. That certainly is too bad. All the same, I can to some extent excuse the prosecutor who brings a charge against such a man. For assuming that this prosecutor has something to say which offers some apparent justification for suspecting the incriminating and then incriminating the man, <coughs> at least he is not just fooling us quite openly by the deliberate concoction of charges that are completely false. And that's why there's no objection to having as many prosecutors as you want. For, after all, it's possible for an innocent man, once he has been accused of something, to secure an acquittal. Whereas, if a man has really committed a crime, you cannot get him condemned for it unless he has first been charged. And, on the balance, it does less harm for an innocent man to be tried than for a guilty man to escape. The reason why the geese on the capital are provided with food at the public expense, and the dogs are kept there too, is in order that they shall give alarm if a thief should appear. It's true that they don't actually possess the capacity to identify a thief, all the same. They sound the alarm if anyone appears on the capital during the night. For that is a suspicious occurrence. And if they err, they err on the side of caution. After all, they're only animals. But if the dogs start barking during the day, when people come to worship the gods, I'm sure someone would give them a broken leg for making a fuss when there were no grounds for suspicion at all. Very much the same consideration applies to the prosecutors. Some of you are geese, who only cackle and can't do any harm. Others are dogs, who can bite as well as bark. We arrange for you to be fed, but you, in return, must direct your attacks against the people who really deserve them. That's what the community wants. Certainly, when there is a probability that some identifiable individual has committed a crime, you can show your suspicion by barking, if you feel inclined to do so. We allow you that much. But if you're determined to go ahead and accuse someone of killing his father without being able to say why or how, if, in other words, you're just going to bark when there isn't any trace of suspicion, it's true that no one will break your legs. But if my knowledge of these gentlemen on the bench is any guide, they'll brand your forehead with the letter which your prosecutors regard with such distaste that you even hate the first day of every month because its name, the Callens, starts with the same initial and they'll do the job so forcibly that in the future you'll not be in a position to bring any accusations against anybody or anything at all, except against the dire misfortune you've managed to get yourselves into. So let me find out from this marvellous prosecutor just what he was really asking me to defend my client against. It's up to him to specify the grounds for suspicion that he hopes to instill in the judge's minds. What will he reply? Presumably, it is this. The younger Sextus Roscius was afraid he was going to be disinherited. So you say. But nobody's put forward any indication whatsoever why he should have had the slightest reason to fear that such a thing was ever going to happen. But that is what the father intended, you say. Well, prove it. There isn't any proof. You can't point a, to a single person whom the elder Roscius either consulted upon the subject or informed of any such intent and you can't even suggest any reason whatsoever why you, yourself allegedly, began to harbour the suspicion. In fact, what you're openly confessing when you produce such an imputation is this. I know what I was paid, but I rather am at a loss as what to say about it. The only thing that weighed with me was Chrysogonus's assurance that Roscius would not find anybody to defend him, since he believed that in the present national situation no one would dare utter a sound about the purchase of a property or about the partnership. Yes, that was the misapprehension that you induced. You to launch the whole fraudulent business. 
If you had believed that anyone was going to contradict you, you would certainly have never said a word. It would have been of value to you, gentlemen, if you had happened to notice the casual way in which Arukius embarked upon this prosecution. I find it easy to believe that what he saw the occupants of the advocates' benches. He inquired whether this or that person was going to undertake the defence. The idea might be that it's going to, no one was going to do so never crossed his mind. The idea that I might be going to do so never crossed his mind, because I had never pleaded in a state trial before. When he found that none of the usual recognised people were going to take the job on, he began to behave in a very relaxed fashion, sitting down, if he felt like it, strolling about, shouting for his slave to order his dinner, I suppose. In other words, he treated you, judges, and everyone else who is assembled here today with as little respect as if he had been no one in the whole place except himself. Finally, he concluded his speech and sat down, and then someone else got up, but it was only myself. Erucius visibly breathed a sigh of relief, because it wasn't one of the others. I began my speech, but at the same time I was able to watch how he went on joking, and made no attempt to concentrate, until I suddenly let drop the name of Chrysogonius. As soon as I uttered that name, name Erucius, immediately started to attend, and seemed to over, be overcome with amazement. I knew very well what had stung him. Then I mentioned Chrysogonus a second and a third time. After that, people started scurrying about in every direction. I imagine they wanted to let Chrysogonus know what was happening. Here was a man in Rome who had the nerve to speak up against his interests. The case was not going the way he had expected to. The facts about the purchase of the property were leaking out, and the partnership was coming in for rough treatment. Chrysogonus's influence and power were being handled disrespectfully. The judges were paying close attention, and as the scandal began to come out, the public began to show how deeply shocked they were. So, you miscalculated about the whole thing, Erucius. You can appreciate now that the entire situation has been transformed. Sextus Roscius's case, as you see, is still perhaps not getting the defence it deserves, but at least someone is defending him, outspokenly. The men you thought were going to betray him into your hands are going to be acting as impartial judges instead. So now you had better muster up some of that old ingenuity and sound sense of yours. What you'd hoped for when you'd come here was some of the pickings, but instead you started to find out what prevails in this court is justice. The charge is parricide, but the prosecutor has not been able to indicate the motive which supposedly impelled the son to kill his father. Now, even when some minor offence is being dealt with, one of the petty misdemeanours which have become increasingly frequent and are now almost da in daily occurrence, the very first thing is always that is done is to make the most meticulous inquiry about the motive. But here we have a trial for the very grave of crime of parricide, and yet Erucius apparently does not consider such an inquiry to be necessary. Yet in regard to an issue of this magnitude, gentlemen, even when there is a clear combination and multiplication of motives, still an accusation is never lightly believed. Still its outcome is not allowed to depend upon superficial conjecture. Still unreliable witnesses are regarded with due suspicion. Still the prosecutor's ability is not conceded to be deciding factor. Moreover, in such cases it is held to be indispensable not merely to prove that the defendant has committed a whole series of previous crimes and has led a thoroughly dissolute life, but actually that his entire character is degraded to the point of utter frenzy and complete mental derangement. And even when all this has been demonstrated, it still remains necessary to point to manifest indications of the specific crime itself, where and how it was committed, and by whose agency and when. And unless these indications are both numerous and beyond question, surely such a dreadful, unspeakable deed must continue to defy belief. For against it is all the strength of human feeling, all the potent ties of blood and relationships. Nature herself cries out against any suspicion of such a horror. It is an utterly unnatural and monstrous phenomenon that a being of human shape and demeanour should so far exceed even the wild animal in savagery 
that he has malignantly extinguished the light of day for the very person who is responsible for his own enjoyment of its life-giving rays. The experiences of parenthood and infancy, bringing up the young and being brought up to teach even wild beasts to be at peace with one another, is the teaching of nature herself. There is a story that not many years ago a certain Titus Cloelius of Tarakina, a man who is quite well known, finished his dinner one night and then went to bed in the same room as his two grown-up sons. In the morning he was found dead with his throat cut. The investigation pointed to no one, no slave or free man against whom suspicion could be directed, while the two sons who had spent the night beside him insisted they had noticed nothing during the night. However, they were charged with murder. The circumstances were certainly most suspicious indeed. It seemed extraordinary that neither of the young men had seen or heard anything whatsoever, and that someone else had actually had the nerve to venture into the room at the very time when Cloelius's two grown-up sons were both there. One may have thought that they would inevitably have realised what was going on and offered some resistance. Besides, there was no one else at all who could reasonably be regarded as liable to suspicion. All the same, the judges were struck by the fact that when the door was opened in the morning, the young men were both found fast asleep, and so they were acquitted and cleared of all suspicion, for no one could believe that any man was capable first of perpetrating such an unspeakable deed which outraged every law that God or man had ever thought of, and then immediately afterwards went to sleep. Surely it was argued. People who have committed such a horrible crime and are incapable of sleeping in peace. Indeed, every breath that they draw renews their terror. The poets have told us of legendary sons who killed their mothers to avenge their fathers, Orestes who killed Clytemnestra to avenge Agamemnon, and Alcmaeon who killed Eryphile to avenge Amphiarius. But even when they are supposed to have been acting in accordance with divine commands and oracles, you must have read how the Furies haunt them and never let them rest, because even the fact that they were performing a duty on behalf of their fathers didn't exonerate them from the crime they had committed. And that, gentlemen, is true, for such is the power and sanctity of the ties of blood that link a man to his own father and mother. A single drop of that blood creates a stain which can never be washed out, that penetrates deep into the heart where it plants madness and frenzy. You are not obliged, of course, to believe literally what you so often see in plays, but a man who has performed such impious or criminal act is pursued and terrorized by the blazing torches of the Furies. What really torments him is his own sinful deed and the terror which is inspired in himself. His own guilt is what harasses and maddens him. The panic he feels is caused by his own ghastly thoughts, his own stinging conscience. These are the abiding furies which live with evil men and continue every day and every night to avenge the parents of sons who are stained with this fearful sin. It is because of the very enormity of the crime of parricide and unless it is quite unmistakably proved that people are unable to credit it, the charge can only carry conviction if a man's youthful life has been completely debauched and his character utterly corrupt and degraded, his way of living outrageously and scandalously extravagant, his capacity for violence unlimited, his wild behaviour not far from insanity. What's more, he must surely have been the victim of his father's hatred, so that he now stands in fear of repression at his hands. He must have depraved friends, slaves who know about the whole business a convenient opportunity, a suitable place for the deed. I would almost go so far as to say that the judges must actually see in his hands stained with the father's blood before they can believe so awful, monstrous and loathsome an action has really been committed. And this very incredulity of the crime means that at once it has been decisively proved its punishment must be all the more severe. Now, our conclusion that our ancestors surpassed all other countries not only in military might but in wisdom and good sense as well is based on a variety of excellent reasons. And one especially valid reason is this. They devised an altogether singular punishment for those who sinned against their parents. For nothing could provide a clearer demonstration that they were indeed wiser than any other nation. According to tradition, the wisest of all states was Athens.
while it was the leader of Greece and the wisest of all its citizens was Solon who drew up the laws they still use there today. Solon was once asked why he had not fixed any penalty for these laws for a man who killed his own father. He replied simply that he could not believe that anyone would do such a thing and that he had been praised because of his refrainment from fixing a punishment for this crime which had up to then never been committed. A decision he took because he was afraid that the establishment of a penalty, far from reducing the likelihood that such a deed would be committed, might suggest its possibility in people's minds. But our Roman ancestors were a good deal wiser still. They realized that there is nothing in the world which possesses a sufficiently eminent degree of sanctity to prevent it from one day succumbing to violence. Consequently, they believed that they must think out a punishment for parricide, and a unique punishment it was. For what they wanted to do was set a penalty so frightful that it would serve as a deterrent, even when nature itself proved powerless to enjoin filial conduct. And so they ordained that anyone found guilty of this crime should be sewn alive into a sack and then thrown into a river. It was a remarkably wise decision, gentlemen. What they did, in effect, was to cut the culprit off and shut him out of the entire sphere of nature by depriving him at one single blow of the sky and the sun, the water and the earth. They created a situation in which the murderer, the very person of whom he owed his own life, should in turn be deprived of all the elements which had given life to the world. To throw the condemned man to wild beasts did not seem to them the right solution. In case this contract, contact with such a monstrosity should make the beasts even more savage towards us than they had been before. And the idea of dropping the guilty man naked into a river, into a sack, with several animals, including a snake in it, they likewise rejected for fear that when his body had been carried down to the sea, it would defile that very element which itself is believed to purify every defilement that exists. In a word, they left the criminal wholly bereft of all the things that are most abundantly available to the rest of the world, breathing to the living, earth to the dead, the sea to those who float upon its surface, the shore to those the sea casts up. These are the most universally available things in the world. Yet men condemned for this crime live, as long as they are allowed to go on living without being able to breathe the air from the sky. They die without the earth coming into contact with their bones. They are tossed about by the sea with its cleansing waters ever reaching them, and in the end, when they are cast upon the shore, even the rocks don't support their dead bodies to give them rest and peace. That is the enormous crime you are imputing to Sextus Roscius, and that is its horrifying punishment. Do you really imagine, Erucius, that you can convince the judges of this calibre, of this crime, that such a crime is committed in spite of your complete and total failure to demonstrate any motive whatsoever. If in the case was actually being pleaded before the purchasers of the property themselves, if Chrysogonus himself was presiding over the trial, even so it surely had been advisable for you to have come to more carefully prepared. There are two things that you have apparently failed to appreciate. First, the extreme solemn nature of this trial, and second, the impeccable integrity of the judges who have conducted it. The case concerns parricide, a crime which it is inconceivable that anyone could commit without motives of the most serious possible kind, and it is being tried by judges of the most utmost shrewdness, who are very well aware of the idea that someone committing even the most trifling offence without any motive whatsoever is inconceivable. All right, you can't produce a motive. Then, in that event, I ought to be judged the winner straight away. However, I won't insist on the right. Indeed, I shall concede to you a point which I should never have been prepared to concede in any other case, and that is the manifest proof of my conviction that my client is wholly innocent. That's to say, I won't even ask why Sextus Roski has killed his father, I only ask how he killed him. Yes, Erucius, that is all I insist you should explain, and I'll tell you how I'm going to deal with you. Although it's my time for speaking and not yours, I'll give you the fullest possible freedom to answer to me, or interrupt me, or even ask me any questions if you like, at any moment. How did he kill his father, then? Did he strike a blow himself, or did he get others to do the job for him? If you are trying to maintain that he did it himself, let me remind you that he wasn't even in Rome. If you say he got others to do it, then who were they? 
Were they the slaves or free men? If they were free men, identify them. Did they come from a Maria or were they of some Roman uh, assassin? If they came from a Maria, I ask again, who are they? I want their names. Why aren't we told them? If they were from Rome, on the other hand, how had Roscius got to know them? For after all, he himself had not been in Rome for many years, and had never on any occasion stayed there for more than three days at any time. So where did he meet them? How did he get into conversation with them? What methods did he use to persuade them? Did he give them a bribe? Who did he give it to? How was it? Who was his intermediary? Where did he get the money from, and how much was it? Surely these are sort of matters... One always has to follow up in order to get back the origins of a crime. And meanwhile, don't forget how you yourself described my client as way of life, and how he was boorish and a savage fellow in the country, and you said he never talked to anyone and just stayed in the media. Now, there's a point in this assertion of yours which might be regarded as a very powerful argument in favour of his innocence. I don't propose to stress it unduly, but the fact is contrary to his habits plain routine, rough, uncultivated manner of life, don't usually presume, uh, produce crimes of this sort. You don't find every variety of crop and tree and soil, by the same token you don't see every sort of crime coming from every type of existence. It's the city centre that creates luxury, and out of luxury inevitably comes greed, and out of greed bursts forth violence, and out of violence proliferates all various kinds of crimes and iniquities. But as the country life, which you describe sneeringly as so rustic, is the teacher of economy. It is honest, hard work, and fair dealing.